So, this was gonna be a top 10 video. This was this is just gonna be a simple top 10 video. In honor of Espinas in Sunbreak, and in this period of excitement that we have for the future of Monster Hunter, I wanted to make a basic top 10 list about the monsters outside of the mainline games that I really, really liked and wanted to see in future Monster Hunter titles. For the uninitiated, there's a number of fantastic Monster Hunter games that we in the West have not had the pleasure of having released here. And in these games are a plethora of fascinating monsters that we have never had the privilege of fighting. The three games of highest relevance to this are Monster Hunter Frontier, Explore, and Online. All non-Western releases, and all as of now, defunct. No one can play them anymore, save for attempts made to salvage the servers that are mostly private and in beta for now. Now, originally, it was stated that the mainline Monster Hunter games would not be getting monsters from these other titles. They would stay separate. They would remain as their own different entities. This has been stated in interviews, but things have changed. The exclusivity of these monsters is gone, because these games are gone. And now, three years after the shutting down of Frontier, three years after all this content was considered dead and buried, lo and behold, Espinas arrives in Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. And not just Espinas, but his flaming Espinas subspecies. And he's a big deal. He's the Rathalos of Frontier. And looking at it in a certain way, the Rathalos of all these non-Western games. A symbol in his own right of the monsters that make up these crazy games we over here never got to experience. And he will likely serve as a herald for things going forward. Now, does this guarantee anything? Not exactly. There is a possibility, though I think very, very slim, that Espinas in Sunbreak was a nod a treat, a novelty, a, a small note of appreciation to these other parts of Monster Hunter, and that's all we're gonna get. And maybe that might have been the case, but we didn't just get Espinas, we got his subspecies, we got Frontier Armor skills, we got Frontier Layered Armor and Event Quests, we got modified Frontier moves from certain monsters. The genie's out of the bottle, and it's not looking like it has any intention of going back in. This slew of Frontier content in Sunbreak, and the excellent series of Monster Hunter Frontier videos made by the guys over at Rage Gaming Videos, who got permission to play an in-beta salvaged version of the Frontier servers, inspired me to dig deeper into these games, and gave me a ton of appreciation for them and their monsters. So like I said at the top, I wanted to make a list of 10 monsters from Frontier, Online, and Explore that I would love to see in the mainline Monster Hunter games going forwards. <laughs> However, not only did I struggle to be happy with a list of 10, not only did I have to make that list of 10 by excluding monster variations and related species to try and keep it to just the original monsters of those games, but my honorable mentions had around a dozen extra entries, and that was with me trying to be picky and exclusive. And I realized that there's simply too much good to talk about. I realized that I genuinely wanted to experience about 95% of these monsters. So, I decided that I was going to do one giant celebratory video talking about all of these foreign beasts and how awesome they are. And then I looked at the list of monsters I had to talk about, so I decided to make three videos, one per game. And I started taking notes for the first script and got halfway through the Monsters in Frontiers lifespan, so I decided to make four videos. <laughs> the first will be the original run of the MMO Monster Hunter Frontier Online, until its G-Rank upgrade. The second will be the Monsters added inset expansion in Monster Hunter Frontier G, and then Monster Hunter Frontier Z. The third video will cover the Chinese exclusive Monster Hunter Online, and the fourth will cover the mobile game Monster Hunter Explore. I'm going to go through these games one by one and give introductions to the massive roster of exemplary creatures that we may have the potential of hunting in the near future. Instead of a top 10 list or a structured ranking, I'm going to tell you how much out of 10 I'd like to see this monster added. So the monsters I want the most would get a 10 out of 10, a monster I absolutely do not want to see will be a 1 out of 10. Y you get the idea. Now, 
I'm going to cover Frontier a bit differently than Online and Explore. Since Frontier was an MMO, with a laundry list of expansions and monsters added all over the power scaling spectrum, I'm going to cover these monsters in the order they were added the best I can using the wikis as a guide. So I apologize if I get something out of order, I'll try and double check everything. Online and Explore have less to go over in more conventional monster releases. So I'm going to go over their monsters in a structure of weakest to strongest, the best way I can approximate. Two things I want to cover before I get started. Number one, I am going to talk about a lot of monsters and a lot of phenomenal monsters. There are some genuinely exceptional concepts and designs in these games. And I think myself and a lot of people want to see these added at some point. But I think it's important that myself and everyone else keeps a realistic expectation about the amount of these guys we're going to get at a time. When MH6 and the games that follow it come out, we are going to expect a healthy roster of classic staple monster picks. We're going to expect that some monsters that have been absent for a couple of years are going to come back. We're going to expect a large variety of totally brand new to that game monsters. And now we're also going to be expecting a stream of ported over non-Western monsters. And three of those four categories are going to be new assets the team needs to create. Manage your expectations going into these future titles and be patient. This is gonna take time. And with such a gigantic roster of high quality monsters, the teams are probably gonna have to be a bit picky about who they bring in. I do think the rosters are gonna get larger and larger for sure, on average, just as these games go. All I'm saying is, don't expect the base game of Monster Hunter 6 to come with 40 staple monsters, 30 frontier monsters, 30 brand new monsters, and 20 monsters we haven't seen in a while. It's going to be a gradual process. Just desire responsibly. The other thing I want to mention before we get started is why it's a good idea to bring these monsters over. Yes, the simple truth of the issue is that we want to fight them. We want to experience them. We want to make their weapons and armor. We want them to have names that we know how to pronounce. <laughs> we do want all that, yes. But the other thing is, these were good games with good content and good ideas that are simply gone. It's not just about giving us cool new experiences. It's about preserving the creativity and hard work of a lot of people over getting close to decades now. That might sound cheesy, but I do mean it. This content is worth preserving. These games are worth preserving in some form or another. All right, that's been more than enough preamble. No more wasting time. We've got a lot of ground to cover and a lot of monsters to showcase. So, without further ado, releasing in the year 2007, we have the outstanding MMO Monster Hunter Frontier Online. Today we are covering the first five years of its life from 2007 to 2012, Monster Hunter Frontier Seasons 1 through 10 and Monster Hunter Frontier Forward 1 through 5. Let's get started with the first three creations of Frontier, which we've actually seen in the mainline games. So, we actually have Frontier's first three original monsters in the main series already. Hypnocatrice, Lavasioth, and Espinaz. Yeah, the worst fight in Monster Hunter World was a Frontier original. And honestly, he wasn't that bad of a fight pre-world. I think he was simply turned into a Jirototus clone with a half-based Ignactor mechanics. He's pretty good in Generations Ultimate. And Hypnocatrice, though not the coolest monster, is a cool bird wyvern. And I think we're in need of some bird wyverns on the upper echelons of power. He's also got a lot of really cool-looking variations in Frontier, which I'll be touching on later. I don't have the strongest feelings towards Lavasioth or Hypnocatrice. I think they're two monsters with a fair amount of potential that I think can be made great, and I wouldn't mind seeing either of them again. They're actually part of the reason we haven't seen Frontier monsters in the main series. Lavasioth and Hypnocatrice were partially created by both the Frontier team and the main series team. Thus, they were brought into Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. When that happened, understandably, Frontier players were upset that the monsters they were paying a subscription to fight were being put in a single payment game. 
if that was the case, then what was the point of paying for an MMO? And that's a very reasonable question and a very reasonable complaint. As a result, our next monster came to this series much later than he originally may have. Espinas is, of course, the starring monster of Frontier, the original inspiration of this video, and a spectacular monster in his own right. You gotta understand, this floored people when he showed up in the Sunbreak trailer. The developers said, in interviews, that this was not going to happen, but by god it did, and damn is he one of the highlight fights of Rise. As is Flaming Espinas, I have heard, though I'm not 100% sure how factual this is, that he was planned to be in either Freedom Unite or in Monster Hunter Try, but his appearance was canned due to Frontier players not wanting to lose the exclusivity of their monsters. And thus, the mainline Frontier drought began, and went on for years. I would be more than happy if Espinas was turned into a series regular. His fight is fun and oppressive, his status and elemental prowess is intimidating but not that annoying, his design is exceptional, his weapons look amazing, I love fighting this guy, and I want him to stick around. He's also got more variations besides flaming Espinas to offer as well. A brief aside, Espinas in Sunbreak is a great representation of what we can expect from Frontier monsters in the modern art style. Some people have concerns over, or straight up dislike, the designs of some of the Frontier monsters. But I think Espinas' artistic rework should put some of those fears at ease. He looks a bit less goofy, especially in the face. His colors work better together, he's more detailed. He's clearly still Espinas, just tightened up and refined, better than he's ever looked. Okay, now let's get to the actually new stuff. For real this time. Akura Vashimu. How have we never had a proper scorpion monster in mainline Monster Hunter? This kind of Celtus Queen, but she's like a, a mix of stuff. Akura Vashimu is just a full-on scorpion. Right off the bat, I love the design. Near jet black in coloration, these beady red eyes, growths of violet crystals on his claws, head and tail, these little tufts of yellow hairs in between the slats in his armor. Not over-designed. You know what you're looking at and can guess what it can do. It looks sinister, menacing, and that big wrecking ball of crystals adds that monster hunter charm. He's a carapacean, same classification as the Hermitar and Sienitar. If he does come over, I wonder if he'll be reclassified as a Temnoseran, since scorpions are arachnids and the Temnoserans are based on spiders. Wouldn't be the first reclassification. This guy has one of the most bonkers complicated mechanics I have ever seen in a Monster Hunter game. To start, Akura Vashimu's tail sprays a liquid internally produced by his body that solidifies into crystal when exposed to air. He uses this for offense and defense, covering important parts of his body and spraying it at enemies. Hunters hit by this liquid slowly begin to be covered in a hardening crystal that drains stamina and can explode after a period of time. Now this can make fighting him very dangerous, and luckily, his tail can be chopped off to prevent him from firing off this liquid. So, how does one chop off his tail? Strap yourselves in, folks. We're about to set a precedent for how crazy this game can get. The color of its blood changes in tandem with the breaking of his body parts, and when his blood changes color, it also changes up his attack patterns. You will need to break his body parts and cycle through these phases of blood coloration if you want to cut off his tail. Here's the process. You ready for this? You gotta break the crystals on his head and pincers with bludgeoning damage. Then, get the actual part breaks for the head and pinchers themselves with severing damage. Breaking these parts individually knocks him on his back, and you can attack his tail. Do this three times, and if his health is low enough and his blood is blue, you can chop his tail off. But, because f you, if his blood is red, he can use his tail to recoat his pincers and head with the crystals. And because double f you, when you do cut off his tail, he will go out of his way to eat his own tail to spite you out of your carves. Oh, 
And that orange hair between his plates of armor? Yeah, that, that inflicts paralysis. I love this. This is actually insane. But I love it. It's borderline too complicated. But I have to imagine the first few times you get this cut, it feels amazing. Here's the thing. This guy's not that difficult. He's not that powerful. This is the starting line. We don't get monsters with this multi-layered part break insanity again, but this is the nutty creativity one can expect from this game. I think he's awesome. I think his gimmick is memorable. I think he looks fantastic with his incredibly dark brown near black shell and the small evil looking red eyes and the crystal armor. And scorpions are just sick. We've been needing scorpion monsters in Monster Hunter. I'm going to give this guy an 8 out of 10 on the want meter. I think this would be an excellent mid-tier monster. Akura Jebia. This is a, I think, named subspecies of Akura Vashimu. Frontier's a couple of monsters like this, where they're kind of considered subspecies, kind of considered their own thing. The, the wiki and some other things I read had kind of conflicting stances on this. If it has a unique name, I'll keep them in the regular section. Unfortunately, there's not a ton to say here that wasn't already said he's a bit sharper looking a bit sleeker he traded purple crystals and a brown shell for icy blue and a dark bluish green he also prefers swamps over deserts jebia differentiates himself the most in his moveset he's got a variety of physical and ranged attacks that i didn't see fashimu use when i was watching gameplay he's got a more aggressive and violent fighting style. He's got harsher claw and tail slams and will fling the crystallized chunks off of his own body and exploding projectiles. His fight looks like a lot of fun, but that's his biggest differentiation. I think I like Vashimu's look a little bit more. Jebia isn't bad, but I don't need both. I'll give him a 6 out of 10 on the want meter. If they did bring him back, I'd be willing to bet they'd expand on him a little bit to make him a bit more different from Vashimu. Peru Kurosu. This is where I apologize to my English-speaking viewers for the non-Romanized names for you to remember. And where I apologize to my viewers who do know Japanese for butchering the pronunciation of some of these names. I think I got some of them down. I've been reading and typing them dozens of times over for the past couple of days, so I think I got these okay. Anyway. This is another rather exceptional monster. He's the apex predator of the Gorge map and is one of the few monsters characterized predominantly by his intelligence. His body is specially designed to protect himself from and control the extremely powerful thunder element his body produces. He can use his horn and the odd-looking spikes on his back to precisely maneuver the lightning he wields, firing it from his mouth in a beam, blasting off sparks from his tail, coating his whole body in it, or directing it to the whip-like appendages coming out of his wings. Now, his body is one complex machine of working components that allow him to direct his lightning and not be harmed by it. So, if his body gets damaged, he runs the risk of harming himself. This is where his intelligence comes in. This is how he preserves himself from himself. And where he goes from fairly impressive too legitimately unforgettable. To protect himself, Beru Kirosu will learn how his opponent fights and change up his fight tactics according to his analysis. In game terms, this means he alters his attack patterns depending on the weapons hunters bring to his fight. How exactly these changes work and how a Beru Kirosu compensates for multiple hunters, I don't know at this moment. Additionally, tying his intelligence and lightning even further together, he is smart enough to recognize when he's about to be captured, and will opt to overload his body with lightning and end himself, rather than be taken alive. 
I think the potential for Berkuroso in a 6th generation game with the progressively more advanced monster AI we're getting is limitless. I think it would be so much fun to trial run all his different potential behaviors with different weapon classes. This could be a really special fight. His design is fairly solid. I love his pterodactyl wolf head shape. I think his whip talon wings are really stand out and look pretty badass. These whips are features he totally doesn't really need, but I think absolutely enhances him. I love his varied yet very kind of understated color palette with this mix of oranges and blues and yellows and other earthy colors. They work in a way that he doesn't look like a mess, but he's very, very colorful. His cylindrical looking back tube spikes and odd looking flat tassel tails coming out of him look a bit strange, but they aren't deal breakers for me. I think they make his design look a bit too busy, but there's reasons for them there in his biology and they help him function. So I'm not going to complain too much. A few minor tweaks, and I think he'll look great. Additionally, barakuroso has got a number of pretty powerful and cool-looking relatives that I'll get to later that could also be added in the wake of his addition to the main series. I'm giving this a 9 out of 10 on the want scale. Fantastic combination of lots of great ideas. Pariapuria. Here's a weird one, but a good kind of weird. He is this ultra gluttonous fish-like flying wyvern, sharing the shape of a Tigrex. Also like Tigrex, he's a physical powerhouse and pretty deceptively large. He's got a lot of slow, heavy-hitting physical attacks, but it's his eating habits that make him more interesting. Pariapuria might move like a Tigrex, but it eats like a devil joe. This thing will swallow up anything it can get. Animals, hunters, stray chunks of meat, straight up just dirt. Yeah, it's got an attack where it'll just spit projectiles of dirt at you and it can automatically stun. This indiscriminate eating habit is where his core mechanic comes in and it almost creates a bit of a mini game. Pariapuria will drool a certain color showing what type of meat it wants to eat, be it drugged, tainted, or tinged meat. While it's eating all this meat meant to inflict status effects, he actually has internal organs that work to protect him whilst he consumes all this tampered with food. Feed it the right kind and Pariapuria will gradually get stuffed full and get slower. Feed it the wrong kind and Pariapuria will throw a tantrum and attack wildly. Feeding him enough results in him slowly plodding around the arena, ignoring the hunters as it struggles to digest the amount of food he took in. It's a great damage opportunity, but I almost kind of feel bad that you feed this thing to the point of making it sick so you can beat the shit out of it. Speaking of making him sick. In order to purge himself of this extra food, in order to weaponize all the food you've been force feeding him, Pariapuria implements his ability that he's most famed for. He vomits it. He vomits the dirt he consumed. He vomits the meat he's been fed. He can even vomit up torrents of water. He regurgitates so violently that he often coughs up parts of his own insides. And that's actually why we hunt them. A lot of body parts of Pariapuria are useless, covered in unwashable mucus and immensely odorous. But the contents of his stomach can often yield valuable materials. I think this is far and away the best gross-out monster. There's nothing quite like him. Fundamentally, I like the idea of a monster using its absolutely repulsive biology to ward off would-be threats. He's kind of ugly. He's super gross. He's really weird. But I think you need that in a game series that has a lot of super badass, elementally powerful, and physical brute monsters. Monsters like Pariapuria help flesh the world out, make it feel more diverse. And I call him ugly, but it's a well-suiting ugly. The big, 
dead looking fish eyes, the bulky, imposing body frame juxtaposed with a lot of these fishy elements, the nice looking earthy color palette with a lot of oranges and browns and yellows and cream colors, and I kind of like these fox ears he's got that somehow don't clash too much with the fish aesthetic he's got going on and serve to relate him to the very feline pseudo-wyvern category. I think this is a really solid entry. I'm going to give him an 8 out of 10 for wanting to see him. Kamu and Nono Oruguran These are the monsters that took male and female monster pairs to another level. We have a pair of wolves who fight in tandem with one another. These two are some of the most fiercely loyal monsters in the whole series. They fight together. They guard each other while they sleep. They will mourn one another if their mate dies. The amount of personality these two have as a pair is really deeply explored in gameplay and is something that a modern Monster Hunter game could probably push really far. That component alone makes them very interesting to me. They're not the craziest monsters in combat, it's really the combination of the two that drives the difficulty of their fights. They themselves individually don't have a lot of over-the-top powers. They have a lot of physical attacks, the ability to dodge pitfall traps, they have quills they can fire from their body, and their roars are capable of inflicting damage. And they're straight up just the TIE Fighter sound effects. <laughs> They do get a nice enhancement in G-Rank, where they can augment their physical attacks with ice. Design-wise, they are Monster Hunter-ified wolves. Great designs that look distinct and recognizable, but they're not at the peak of Monster Hunter visual creativity. The mohawks they have help them stand out, and I think those are pretty great features. They don't look goofy or over the top, they just look good. Kamu and Nono would be great additions to Mainline Monster Hunter. I would love to see how modern AI and animations could push their teamwork and loyalty even further. These two have a lot of life and personality in them. And as I'll get to in the next video, they pave the way for another fantastic monster entry. I'm going to give Kamu Nono Urugaran a 9 out of 10 as a package deal for monsters I would like to see. You got to do the two together. Laviente. One of the largest monsters in the entire series, his only competition being Dolomiter and Zora Magdoros. This guy is godly powerful, and a very mysterious ancient monster, not even considered an elder dragon. The base Laviente fought in Frontier was found awakening from beneath an island after decades and decades of not eating. Its goal was to consume everything it could to satiate his colossal form. And should he run out of food on his home island and make landfall, it would be utter devastation. Laviente is an absolute leviathan capable of wiping out whole ecosystems due to his ravenous hunger and the volcanic activity it can trigger simply by moving through the earth. This thing is a localized, slithering apocalypse. In terms of its combat prowess, as if its sheer physical might wasn't already enough, Laviente is capable of breathing fire, powerful charged up blasts of it. He can emit paralyzing electrical shocks, can misshape the earth around him, cause flying rocks to hurl towards targets, can release an explosive powder, cause geysers of erupting lava simply by burrowing into the ground, and his roar is powerful enough to create twisters. Laviente itself is immensely powerful, yes, but the danger is amplified by the way it rips up and shifts the environment around it, causing cataclysms simply by moving. And this is where I think Laviente's greatest potential is found. He has a decent arsenal of abilities, 
He is strong, but he's also an old school giant monster hunter monster. The spectacle and novelty of these fights can run their course when the monsters let itself get hit for two minutes straight before doing anything. Point being, this is a very difficult thing to execute in a fun way. But I think having the battle be against the world unfolding around you could be the bump that Laviente would need to be a spectacular encounter. Imagine having the ground rip apart beneath your feet. Lava leaking up from the earth, making the ground progressively more dangerous. Trees and boulders flung to and fro at you haphazardly. With all the increased movement options we've been getting as hunters, this could be a super fun and intense mechanic. Having Laviente turn the world into his weapon is the vision that I and I think the developers have for this monster. And it's absolutely possible. It'd be a ton of work, but I can see the potential. And the fact that I want what he could be as to opposed to what he was in Frontier does dock him a few points. Not many, but a few. I do think a 6th generation Laviente could be a masterpiece of a fight. Some other points to note. He is the original siege fight. Yeah, Kolv Taroth did not invent this mechanic. Her fight borrowed the several separate groups of hunters whittling away at one massive health pool over several hunts from Laviente. And I think she and Safi Jiva showed how good this mechanic can get. Bringing in the original siege monster and having him ramped up to 11 with the modern siege mechanics would be a really good idea. Another thing to note is that he has a subspecies that addresses some of the boring big monster concerns already. Berserk Laviente is much more of a straight up fight than the original Laviente. We'll talk more about him in the second video of this series. Finally, I think his design is excellent. The orange, the greens, the massive tusks, the snake-like texture, the giant body-spanning back fin, his facial structure is evocative of an eastern mythological dragon. I think he's flat out perfectly designed. Great color scheme. Nothing looks out of place or excessive. He looks pretty phenomenal. I'm gonna give this guy a 7 out of 10 for how much I want him. I think a phenomenal monster is there, and the budget and technology to fulfill the vision of this monster are there too. But the giant monsters are massive gambles. Very difficult to balance right, very easy to get wrong, and probably immensely expensive. Luckily, Laviente already has a pretty strong foundation to build upon if they ever decide to bring him back. Duragawa. We got another pseudo flying wyvern from Frontier, and another good monster. Whereas Pariapuria is a physical powerhouse, Duragawa is a swift and agile hunter with more elemental prowess. Where Pariapuria is a loud, disgusting, and voracious consumer of anything it can fit its mouth around, Duragawa is a stealthy, sly, and secretive monster that kept itself off the guild's radar for a long time. I like the dichotomy of these two against one another, because it shows how different you can make monsters of the same type. One a gross-out, gluttonous fish, the other a cunning fox, both pseudo-flying wyverns. Doubling back to its elemental power, this is Duragawa's biggest mechanic. He's all about ice. He can create swirling tornadoes of ice merely by swiping his claws. Breathe large blasts of it, amplify his attacks with it, and encase his head, tail, and claws in it. He looks great transformed like this. In fact, he looks great in general. I think the teal coloration and the orange accents on his claws and spines works really well. I like the permanent snarl he has where his teeth don't properly fit in his mouth. Gives him this feral appearance. Only thing I don't love is this big uh, artichoke tail end looking thing. Mostly a damn good design. Really standout colors. Before committing to knowing the names, I always remembered the teal and orange one. Duragawa has one major roadblock for me, his niche. Baryoth competes with Duragawa pretty hard. We already have an upper mid-level ice-producing pseudo-flying wyvern. Additionally, you got other ice armor monsters like Xamtrios and Velkana, but Baryoth 
is the big obstacle. And it's not even that I would mind if Duragawa took Baryoth's niche for a little bit. And frankly, on top of that, I don't even care all that much if they were both in the same game together. If there's two monsters occupying a similar niche, I'm all for both of them. But I realize that that consumes more game development resources, going towards very similar monsters. It's just that we have a monster who fits this base archetype description. So I don't have as strong a desire to fight him as I do for some of these other monster concepts that we don't really have in the main series, if that makes sense. I would personally prioritize monsters that are more unlike anything I have ever fought. That's not a knock on Duragawa, I just don't think he's been dealt the best hand in this scenario. Duragawa does have one thing that helps him escape that niche though, his habitat. A lot of the time you'll fight him in an arena akin to the towers, but he also prefers very dry and warm maps like the Gorge. And that's a little bit more impactful than one might think. Ice monsters are one of the most, maybe the most, region-locked groups of monsters out there. I mean, think about it for a second. Giadrome, Blangonga, Zamtrios, Gameth, Glacial Ignactor, Beotodus, Baryoth, Gosharag, Lagombi, Yukonlos, Jade Baroth, all stuck on snow maps. The best you really get out there is a couple of wandering monsters like Velkana and Lunagoran. Having Duragawa shake this map pigeonholing for this element type up, I don't think that would be insignificant. I think he needs to undergo some attack overhauls for me to be really excited to see him in a mainline game. Put simply, I think he's a good monster that does not have as much new to offer as some of his contemporaries. I think I'm going to give him a 7 out of 10 for how much I'd like to see him. Doragyurosu A subspecies or relative of Berukurosu. Kind of like Akura Jebia to Akura Vashimu. And again, similar to that situation, there's not a ton new to say. His color palette shifts to white and green with some orange, especially when enraged. The fur on his back and head will shift from white to orange and stand on end a little bit more. This is in opposition to his cousin's more earthy colors. He trades the arid gorge map for the snowy mountain peaks, and his thunder element has been replaced with the dragon element. Overall, I don't like his colors quite as much as Better Kirosu. I do think the white and green look good in motion on the snow, better than they look in his render, but I kinda wish they kept the fur white. For whatever reason, maybe it's just how bright it is, I don't especially love the orange he gets when he rages. The other sticking point for me is that I really appreciated the specially designed body that Better Kirosu had to handle the specifications of the thunder element. That made him really interesting to me. Slapping dragon on that body kinda makes sense because it looks very lightning-like, but I feel like the ultra-specific biology of Better Kirosu made him special and intriguing. So just swapping the elements isn't my favorite thing doesn't kill this monster for me, but I really liked reading up on how the original body was so especially designed. That being said, Doragyurosu is a cool monster. He looks really, really good in movement, better than I thought he was going to when I was just looking at his picture. He has the benefit of being related to a monster that I already really love. I think the dragon elements coming out of a white-colored monster on a snow map is a really, really cool visual. And he makes good use of the dragon element, with a lot of scattershot projectiles, physical augmentation, huge slam attacks. If Better Kirosu was in a game, I could see Dora Kirosu being a monster in a title update. Hey there, this is editing process, Connor. So I'm going to interject here in the Doragyurosu section a little bit because I got more information on him while I was working on editing the video, not in the scripting process. So I still stand by what I said about I liked the very specific biology of Berkirosu and putting another element on there doesn't quite stick with me, but I do think it's valid that the dragon element is 
very Thunder-like. It is probably the best parallel to it. And so out of all of the other four, that one probably makes sense, especially with him. As someone who did get very, very attached to how this creature was constructed, I think Dragon Element is a sensible enhancement to his abilities. Some of the things that I didn't bring up is due to the fact that Doragirosu has the Dragon Element within him, it pushes the potential of the creature past what Berukirosu could ever do. So this is a creature that goes through more drastic changes. In terms of more powerful versions, Berukirosu only has a hard core version as far as I'm aware whereas Doragirosu goes up into some of the higher echelons of power uh, such as a supremacy species a zenith species when we get to Monster Hunter Frontier Z in the next video he has the phantom Doragirosu which is a permanently enraged version so I do think that's kind of cool and I'm going to give him a little bit more credit than I did in the original script dragon element makes sense as a replacement for thunder with this biology as someone who's not the the biggest fan of some of the dragon subspecies because it's supposed to be this very mysterious element and sometimes it just feels a little bit just kind of tacked onto a creature especially in terms of i say ebony odogaron I think this one makes the most sense here, and they do the most with it, where they actually push the potential of this creature further and further to these super high levels of power because he has the dragon element, and he has his intelligence, and he has his flight prowess, and he has his biology, and the dragon element is able to push Doragirosu to levels that his base species are just incapable of getting to. As someone who is originally not a huge fan of just kind of putting the dragon element on a creature that was hardwired for thunder, I do really appreciate the fact that they took this super powerful element and used it to enhance the potential of this animal to the nth degree, really. So for that reason, I find Doragirosu a lot more fascinating than I had originally considered. As I'll talk about later in this video, I'm not sure if we will see see uh, hardcore or supremacy monsters again if these core monsters in and of themselves come back but if we ever see Berukirosu and Doragirosu again I hope that the dragon element kicking this creature up into the stratospheres of its potential is something that gets carried over and I think for that reason I'm pretty sure in the original script he has a 7 out of 10 for how much I want him I do think I'm gonna bump that one to an 8 for Doragirosu, just because I think that extra level of his biology, that extra level of his potential, makes him a lot more interesting than a lot of subspecies and a lot of variants sometimes are. Alrighty, uh, we will get back to the regular video now. Guren Zaburu. This is just a damn solid monster. I like how he looks, I like how he fights. He's got a few interesting shenanigans, but nothing too ridiculous. I really like this guy. Guren Zaburu is an ultra-territorial, brutal flying wyvern, given the title of Barbarian Wyvern. He's got a no-holds-barred, fight-to-the-death, take-no-prisoners type of vibe. There's a lot of those in Monster Hunter, but his aggression is simply on another level. He'll use his entire body to fight you. His full weight, everything with reckless abandon. His singular horn is his primary method of attack, but he'll use his bite, tail, wings, everything. He'll even leap up into the air and slam his whole weight down. That's one thing I like about him. He doesn't fly a lot. But a lot of the bigger, stronger, heavier flying wyverns make next to no use of their wings in combat. He does so at least a little bit. Although he's predominantly a physical attacker, he does have a decent grab bag of tricks to help him stand out. He has a fairly standard array of water elemental attacks, mainly beams and projectiles. He does have some cool ways of dealing with being immobilized. He can fight back when stuck in pitfall traps, and he can release a paralyzing gas from his underside after he himself is paralyzed. I love the idea of a monster being able to counter some of the best damage dealing opportunity creating tools that we have in our arsenal, both out of natural defenses or the sheer will to muscle through them. 
His final weapon is the spikes on his tail. He can fire them off to stick into the ground. In stormy weather, these spikes act as lightning rods, summoning bolts of lightning conveniently when players stand near them. This is a double-edged sword, and a desperate move, however. Guren Zaburu can be shocked by these bolts himself, and a wise hunter would use this ability against him. I really like this guy. I love the dark blue colors with the red accents. I think raw, aggressive, physical attacker monsters are a lot of fun. He does some attacks that other flying wyverns of his shape don't do. I think the counters to traps are inventive. I think his design feels very classic Monster Hunter. There's nothing I'd really change about him visually. And he's got one more tidbit that I really do like about him. Despite his ultra-aggressive nature, this behavior is reserved only for perceived threats. Communities of herbivores will actually live around Gurenzaburu because he's more than content to eat plants and insects and lives peacefully alongside them. He effectively serves as a guard dog against other large predators. I would love to see this interaction and dynamic explored in Modern Monster Hunter. I'm going to give this guy a 9 out of 10 for how much I want him. I really like him. Ruko Diora. Okay, so we've gotten through Frontier's first 10 expansions, and we are now on Monster Hunter Frontier Forward. Forward brought a fairly hefty new chunk of content to Frontier, and with that chunk is Frontier's first original Elder Dragon, Ruko Diora. And Ruko Diora brought with him a brand new mechanic and status, Magnetism. This guy fights by ripping chunks up out of the ground to defend itself, or hurl at others. The scales it releases from its wings are electrically charged, and whatever those scales come into contact with are subject to the magnetic influence of Ruko Diora. He can move objects around, lift up chunks of the ground, and even push and pull hunters who get magnetized. Ruko Diora can even amplify the dragon element his body creates with his electricity to even further push its power. The electrical charge he possesses is so powerful and so consistent that he is even capable of muscling through paralysis and continuing to move whilst being inflicted with the status. Ruko Diora's powers are fascinating. His only drawback at the moment is that there are other monsters in Mainline Monster Hunter who have taken his core gimmick and expanded on it. Narwa and Ibushi do a lot of what he does. Ripping up chunks out of the ground with their wind and magnetism is core to their fight. And by simple virtue of them being newer and on a better engine, they add a level of spectacle that Ruko Diora was unable to show. They do, however, lack the ability to manipulate hunters on the same level that Ruko Diora can. This is a very remediable issue, though. You could get nutty with a modern Ruka Diora. Have him lift hunters up into the air, send them flying, send them careening into one another. Have him lock in place with your metal armor. Let him slow down your attacks by pushing back on your metal weapons. Some Magneto versus Wolverine type of ordeal. Oh, and his big thing in Frontier was that he attacked a major human fortress. Let him turn the cannons and ballista on the hunters. Go crazy, do something like that. This, this is just a handful of ideas. I think with magnetism, the sky is the absolute limit. It's such an effective weapon against people who predominantly use metal armor and metal weapons and metal installations and metal fortifications. It is so ripe for creativity. Just imagine a monster who could turn nearly your full arsenal against you, both that you're wearing and in the fortress itself. I think the best way to balance this is that he can only really manipulate one hunter at a time, and the other hunters have to work to break his focus. Not too sure how you'd balance this for a single player, but uh, probably just get a magnet-proof skill or something like that. I think there's something really, really special here. 
I like him design-wise too. The dark scale pattern contrasted on his gorgeous, vibrant wings. The extremely underrated and rarely implemented V wing shape. His rather slender frame, which highlights how his might comes from his manipulation of his electricity, not his physical strength necessarily. The dichotomy of his massive wings with his scrawnier body. I think his horns are a little bit messy. Something doesn't quite click, but they don't look bad per se. And the rest of his head looks properly badass. I think he's going to need some enhancements for him to really shine in a post-Storm Serpent era. But I think it's a very attainable goal. I'm going to give him an 8 out of 10 for how much I'd like to see him. Unknown, the Black Flying Wyvern. Yep, that's its name. That's its official name, at least. I found out that it has, I guess, a nickname, maybe? Apparently, in some versions of the game, Hunter's Fighting Unknown would be listed as Fighting Raro. So, maybe that's its name? Might become its name? I, I, I don't know. At face value, it looks like a black and red Raffian. How it's related to the Raths? We don't know. Where does it make its nest? We don't know. Is it dimorphic, like the rats? What's the source of its power? Why is it so violent? How many of them are there? What's their natural habitat? What do they eat? How do they interact with other wildlife? We don't know. They are enormously enigmatic, tough to track, dangerous to get close to, and damn hard to kill. Their most notable quality is their bottomless well of anger. These are hateful, damn near evil creatures. The standard unknown has five levels of enrage. It will never revert to its base state. It will never de-escalate. Once it's angry, it will stay angry, and it will get angrier unless one of you dies or it is driven away. Now, I said the words standard unknown because there is both a supremacy species version of Unknown and a super endgame, ridiculously powerful, ultra aggressive Unknown known as the Solstice War or Shiten Unknown. That one can go to a seventh level of enrage. For context, this version of Unknown came packaged with an upscaled version of Frontier's Black Dragon level monster, Disufiroa. That's the level of power we're talking about. That on its own is incredibly interesting. That a monster that looks like is probably related to and in its calmest state fights on the same level as a Rathian 
has possibly the potential to reach the power threshold of the most exclusive, most dangerous, and most feared tier of monsters in Monster Hunter. Exactly how canon that is, is up in the air, but all I'm saying is that it was just Di Sofiroa and Unknown who got this Solstice War or Shiten treatment. It might be a shorter list to tell you what this thing can't do, rather than what it can. An unenraged unknown fights like a Raffian, your standard flying wyvern moveset. But each level of enrage builds and builds and builds upon this thing's toolkit, manifesting a near ceaseless barrage of varied, unrelenting, and overwhelming weaponry. Fireballs, flame beams, the strength to rip up chunks out of the earth, projectile spines shot out of its wings that it can regrow, venomous talons, corrosive gas, faster and faster, stronger and stronger with each level. And that's the basic one. Its supremacy version gains access to its sixth level of enrage. It can charge its fireballs to make them stronger, break their fireballs into multiple smaller versions, throw its wing spikes so hard that they tear up the ground around them, has a roar so loud it can stun hunters, can rip the ground apart by stomping its wings, beats of its wings so mighty it can knock hunters up into the air and then pursue after them in kind of a revenge reverse dive bomb in its most powerful state. Unknown's wings, talons, eyes, and spikes glow with a deep, bloody crimson. It can wreathe the arena in jet black mist, obscuring it to the point where you can see nothing but the glow of its eyes flying around the map in a corkscrew before inhaling the mist and releasing it in a shockwave. It can kick up a hurricane of black wind that rips the tower you fight it on into pieces, flinging massive chunks of debris around the arena. The absolute might of this monster is demonic. The other bit of interesting info about Unknown is that it's an invader, capable of interrupting hunts for other monsters and wreaking havoc. I really only have one hang-up about this incredible monster. It doesn't make sense to model your super enigmatic monster after the mascots, which are, as far as I'm aware, canonically enormously common, enormously ecologically successful, and very well-documented monsters. One of the coolest things about Monster Hunter lore is the massively expansive, intricate, multi-layered, and competent Hunter's Guild. Even if the guild doesn't know much for absolute certainty about this monster, they can make educated guesses. They must have entire tomes of research about the rafts. They have probably decades of groundwork to try and piece this thing together. This specific monster, being ultra enigmatic, simply doesn't work for that reason. Gormagala worked as a mystery monster in 4 Ultimate because nothing looked like it. Nothing fought like it. Nothing had access to its frenzy virus. Up till that point, both in-game and in the lore of the world, there was nothing like Gore. All things considered, this is a particularly arbitrary sticking point, but I do think it's warranted. Everything else I'm totally fine with. I'm fine with a terrifying relative of the rats. I think it's sick that it's an invader. I think the multi-tier rage mechanic is phenomenal. I think its roster of abilities are sick. I am 100% down with a relative or variation of Monster Hunter's mascots possibly having the power potential of a black dragon. I actually think that would be very fitting if that were to become official. All of that is fine, but it needs a name. That or this concept should be shifted to another monster. But honestly, I'd rather the former. I think this color scheme looks great on the Rathian model, and I'll repeat, I think the series mascots deserve some form of incarnation at this power threshold. I'm giving unknown or maybe Raro, or whatever the hell they call this thing, a 9 out of 10 for how much I want it. Just give it a name.
Gogamoa. Okay, now, let's reel everything way down and relax. We had two outlandishly powerful super monsters back to back. Let's talk about another unique, endearing, and high personality mid to low tier monster. Because I love those two. Gogomoa is a primate-like fanged beast. Similar, but not directly related to monsters like Rajang, Blanganga, and Kongalala. Gogomoa is famous for two things. One... They can fire a strong, silk-like substance from their palms. Two, they are enormously protective parents that can sometimes fight you while carrying its baby on its back. <laughs> yep, this giant monkey will fight you to the death while its baby gets a piggyback ride. It is possible to damage the younger creature, but if you deal enough damage to the point where it flees, the Gogomoa will go into a permanent berserk-like rage. So yeah, refrain from hitting the baby. <laughs> That's, that's the one thing about Gogomoa. You can't slay the baby, but you obviously can kill the parent. I, uh, I don't want to look at the kid I'm orphaning. I prefer when that's off screen, thank you. <laughs> so the Silk Ordeal. Well, Gogomoa takes the whole spider monkey idea and ramps that up to 11. They have organs in their palms that produce silk like a spider. When combined with adhesive chemicals found in their saliva, this silk gets incredibly strong. Strong enough to support this massive monster swinging through trees. Strong enough to entangle hunters and other prey. Strong enough that Gogomo can use it to uproot massive chunks of the earth beneath your feet and throw it at ya. This is a super fun monster. I love how it looks. Might need an HD touch-up to the face, but otherwise, I love the bright red and cream-colored fur, the mohawk, the enormous claws, the prehensile tail, and I'm just a fan of the monkey monsters in general. I'd love to get another one. His fighting style is pretty unique, even in an era where we have full-on spider monsters now, and his ecology is really fun. I'd love to interact with one in a game like Monster Hunter World, where the monster ecology was more fleshed out in the gameplay. It's said that they're really only aggressive when they have their young with them. So you could have a peaceful solo Gogomoa, or aggressive ones caring for their young. Their ability to swing from trees and climb them is perfect for the more vertical Monster Hunter we have now. This would be an outstanding addition to the core Monster Hunter roster. Giving this one a 9 out of 10 for how much I want to see him added. Abiorugu. I wish I had a bit more to say about this guy than I do, because I think he looks amazing. I think his theme is immaculate, and holy actual sh The Monster Hunter World Resurgence modding team made a phenomenal mod for World that implements Abiorugu, and just, damn, dude, minus a little bit of animation jank, that thing does not look like a mod. Side note. Apparently Resurgence is going to announce their next monster mod soon. I don't even have World for Steam, and I really want to see what they do. Side side note, the name for Abio Rugu in that mod is Abio Gladius. I couldn't confirm if that's an actual Romanized localization of his name, or just something the mod team came up with, so I'm just going to keep saying Abio Rugu. That mod, honestly, gives him a bit of an unfair advantage. It just looks so crazy good that it bumped my desire to see him in the series. Now that I actually have seen how good he would look. Abiorugu bumps into the same issue that Duragawa did for me. Niche. I think he clashes with both Glavinus and Devil Joe. Two very popular, very good monsters. Devil Joe especially being one of the staple monsters in the series roster now. Abiorugu is a massive, aggressive, green brute wyvern who weaponizes the fire element and has a sword tail. The biggest difference 
and I think this is his saving grace here, is that he doesn't quite fight like either Glavinus or Devil Joe. He implements his tail, but it's not a staple of his entire moveset. He makes good use of his elemental prowess like Devil Joe, but uses it more in the form of charged bursts rather than sweeping beams. He's also a fair bit smaller than the two, and I think agility would be more heavily implemented into his moveset as opposed to the overwhelming physical prowess of Devil Joe. He's got a lot of full body attacks that hit in several places at once, making him adept at fighting groups. Further separating him from his contemporaries is his willingness to hunt in pairs, whereas the other two are pretty much exclusively solo hunters. You could absolutely make the necessary tweaks to make him feel different enough. And, as I said with Juragawa, ideally, I don't really mind if we have two or more monsters in the game that fill very similar roles. If all three of these monsters were in the same game, I would be happy. But again, that's a lot of resources dedicated to very samey monsters. And I'm not sure I want Abiorugu enough that I'd want him instead of the other two. Devil Joe especially, who has only been absent for one game, but I very much miss him. I think his charged fireball combos look like a lot of fun to go up against. And he's got a few unique slams and swipes that other brute wyverns don't have. I think the red-orange claws, horns, and spines work really well for him with this core deep forest green coloration he has. I love the kinda ceratopsian head crest he has and the stegosaurus reminiscent dorsal plates, implementing a few more dinosaurs into his design. He looks excellent, and brute wyverns are always going to get a bump in my opinion. I'm gonna give this guy a 7 out of 10 for wanting him. Tycoon Zamuza Man, for a game that is famous and infamous for its god-level, super-crazy, ridiculous monsters, its mid-tier monsters are consistently bangers. Tycoon Zamuza is a seemingly hulking carapacion found deep in underground caves. He begins as a slow, lumbering, massive crustacean with a gigantic club-like claw and a slightly less gigantic claw. He looks like a golem of some kind, an amalgamation of nature morphed into the form of a crab. This, however, is not what Tycoon Zamuza really looks like. This isn't even his shell. This is layers and layers of dirt and rock and mushrooms and barnacles and all kinds of other crap melded into a set of natural armor. This is both battle armor and very effective camouflage. Battling with Tycoon Zamuza will slowly knock off chunks of his armor, revealing a brilliant orange shell beneath. With his proper shell revealed, Zamuza gets much faster and more aggressive. He utilizes his different sized pincers in tandem. The larger one is for bludgeoning and defending from attacks, whereas the smaller one is for slicing and stabbing at his foes. The more damage he takes, the lighter, faster, and more violent he becomes. But this is still not Tycoon Zamuza's true form. When he is pushed to the brink, and fears for his life, he will shatter his battered orange shell and reveal the ghostly pale blue crab that has been fighting you the whole time. It's almost uncanny. It's so different from what he started out looking like. How on earth did this animal move with all that armor? All those earthly colors stripped away for this ghostly alien blue. He's more susceptible to damage like this, but he is also lightning fast. Actually though, he has now revealed lightning producing organs that can strengthen his physical attacks. On his last legs, Tycoon Zamuza abandons defense altogether and fights as fast and brutal as he can until finally being put down. What a fantastic monster. All three forms look amazing. His fight evolves as it goes. His elements and environment interactions change. His attack patterns and strategies change as he gets desperate. His elemental weaknesses change as he loses his armor. He shifts up the environment between phases by causing cave-ins. The Carapacians in general are a fantastic and underrepresented monster category, especially for how old they are. 
I didn't think I'd be so enamored with this guy, but the more I learn about him, the more I see of him, the more I really, really like him. That's our first 10 out of 10, and it ain't the last. I'd absolutely love to see Tycoon Zumuza make his debut in the main series. Kuwaru Sepusu. Now, we get Frontier's first entry to what might be my first or second favorite monster type, the Leviathans. They're in contention with brute wyverns, it depends on the day. Why yes, I did start with Monster Hunter Try, how could you tell? The overly spiky, spiny, pointy monster designs of Frontier are a turnoff for some people, and while I don't 100% agree, I do get it. Kuwar Sapusu is a pretty prominent example of this design aesthetic, and for the life of me, I have no idea why I really f like how this guy looks. It's maybe the Legiacris blinders, but I'll never admit it. The slew of jagged crystals sticking out of his body, the oddly square-like scale pattern, the massive horn, the gigantic set of underbite fangs on the second layer of his mouth that make a cage around the rest of his teeth when his mouth is closed, the cluster of crystals near his neck and the back of his head that kind of look like a mane a little bit, the dark brown of his scales contrasted with the bright cerulean crystals, something about it all clicks. All these bizarre elements combined together to make a creature that is so odd, so crazy looking, yet so unique and honestly badass. He doesn't look like any other Leviathan, or any other crystal monster really. As a physical attacker, he shares a lot of moves with Legiacris and Ignactor. Bites, tail sweeps, body checks, he can even corkscrew into the ground like Ignactor, and come bursting in and out of the ground in rapid succession. My absolute favorite move of his is when he stabs his horn into the ground and uses it to hold him in place as he spins his whole body around that access point. Now that's all well and good, but let's talk about the star attraction, the crystals. Kwarasupusu has a very adaptable biology. The crystals in his body can react in different ways to different environments and different weather conditions. These crystals can absorb, store, and redirect energy from sunlight and electricity. In sunny weather, his beam attacks deal fire damage, and he's capable of releasing bursts of light that can blind hunters. In stormy weather, his beam attacks deal lightning damage, and he has the ability to paralyze hunters. That, in and of itself, is super cool, but we're far from done. The crystals can be shaken from his body, and can be stuck into the ground. First of all, they can charge up with elemental power and explode when hunters are nearby. Second of all, their respective elements can ricochet between them, though that might just be the hardcore version of the monster when I was looking at gameplay. Third of all, you can attack these crystals, break them, and supercharge your weapon with a single hit of that additional elemental damage type, both of which Kuwara Sapusu is weak to. How cool is that? What a fantastic interaction. One or two of these layers were more than enough, but the mechanics of this monster just keep stacking and stacking. The creativity of his kit is so damn cool. They push this guy to the limits of creativity. And we're not done yet. Kuwara Sapusu gains different abilities depending on what map he's on. In the Highlands, where the weather constantly changes, Kuwara Sapusu will often swap between his fire and lightning powers in correlation with the weather. At the Great Forest Peak, the storms the region experiences have supercharged him with electricity, making it far more deadly and adding to the range of his electrical attacks. In the desert, Kuwara Sapusu can actually be found in rare pairings. These two will communicate by flashing their crystals to one another, where they combine a discharge of massive amounts of solar energy in a colossal explosion that incinerates everything in a massive area and blinds any hunters beyond the explosion. The only safe zone from this ability is, well, another zone. 
Kawara Sapusu is the epitome of you didn't need to go this hard. The element swapping, the changing with the weather, the different abilities in different zones, the weapon buffs. This feels like four monsters all compiled into one. Kawara Sapusu is peak Monster Hunter creativity. This is the kind of monster that makes Monster Hunter special. All wrapped up in a funky yet super badass Leviathan. 10 out of 10. Not a question. Aruganosu and Goruganosu. Okay, so we have an enigmatic monster that we literally call unknown. But if I'm being honest, I have more questions about these guys. Why are there silver and gold Piscine wyverns at the top of a tower? I don't know. Why did they look exactly like Lavasioth? How did they get here? And what do they eat? Where do they nest? How, do, how does this work biologically? I don't know. How do they swim through solid rock? Why do they battle in pairs in any quest you fight them in? I don't know. Why do they have a seemingly special instinct to hate and fight each other, yet will then decide to team up against anyone who enters their conflict? I don't know. Why do they have better teamwork cohesion than a couple of the partner monsters that mate for life? I don't know. Why do they still attack each other sometimes when they're fighting you, like they're shonen anime rivals? I don't know. What was the idea behind this fight? I don't know. Do I want them in mainline Monster Hunter? I don't know. <laughs> I'm of two minds. I think Aruganosu and Goruganosu are peak Monster Hunter silliness. Which, whether you like it or not, is very much imbued within the game's DNA. Two gigantic silver and gold fish, for some reason, went to the top of a tower that they can swim through and decided to beat the snot out of each other. Unless anything enters their turf war, in which they will join forces to put down the invader. They will combine their lightning and ice elements to make tornadoes. They have the standard roster of Piscean Wyvern physical attacks. They can dig beneath the surface of the tower and attack from below. The Silver Aruganosu weaponizes ice projectiles and can inflict paralysis, whereas the Golden Goruganosu utilizes the thunder element for its projectiles and can induce sleep. They will knock each other out of their stuns and sleep. They will pick each other up from near death to prolong a fight and keep their ally alive, meaning you have to drain both of their health pools at a fairly equal rate throughout the fight. And yet, they will actively take swings at each other and get in cheap shots on one another when they can. Monsters like the Wraths and Orugorons don't have mechanics like this. And like I said, those mate for life. These fish apparently hate each other, and this is the only way you can fight these guys. They don't appear on any other map, they don't appear separate. And it's the fact that they're painted Lavasioth. Used to be considered supremacy species of Lavasioth, but they got changed to their own thing. That element of them being giant metal fish who do this makes this all so much funnier. This is as goofy as Monster Hunter gets. There's nothing quite like this. Nothing fights quite like this. Nothing has mechanics or personalities quite like this. And as much as I do find the humor and love how wild this encounter is, I think this may be a step too far for a mainline Monster Hunter game. This fits a bonkers side game MMO of questionable at best canonicity. This fits Frontier, but these two are so specific, so quirky, that they don't feel quite like animals. 
I don't value that part of Monster Hunter above all else, but I do very much appreciate the attention to detail, in-depth biology, and aspects of realism in Monster Hunter. So how do these guys work? How do they function? Why do they always fight? Why do they help and hinder one another in a fight with hunters? How does that factor into instinct? It seems like so much personality that it borders on being sapient. And I can buy limited sapiency in Elder Dragons, but two separate species of giant fish? I wouldn't mind experiencing this as a fight in a video game. On that level, this sounds really fun, but there's aspects about this that I don't love as an encounter in Monster Hunter. So, as is my opinion, splitting it right down the middle. 5 out of 10 for how much I'd like to see these guys. Odi Batorasu We've got one new monster left for today, and he is a big boy. He is cousin to Akantor and Yukonlos, the Red God to match their white and black, a desert-dwelling Goliath known as the Cannon Rock Wyvern. These guys are seldom seen, content to live out in the desert and relax under the sand. The guild usually doesn't bother with Odibatarasu unless there's a large population of Akuravashimu in the area. When that occurs, Odibatarasu goes hunting, and the destruction that comes from this can disrupt entire ecosystems. Odibatarasu's most famed feature is his massive shell, and the relation it shares with the immense amounts of sand he ingests. There's a number of openings along the sides of his shell from which he ejects excess sand from his body. He can also fire beams of it from his mouth. Though his most distinct usage of the sand in his body is when an organ he has hardens it into a massive projectile which can be fired from a large hole at the front of his shell like it's a cannon. This is so goofy that it's cool. Yeah, it, it feels a bit more Pokemon than Monster Hunter. Okay, it feels very Pokemon, but it's a lot of fun. The giant desert god turtle has a sand artillery gun. That's fun. He's very good at manipulating the sand around him, too. Kicking up massive waves of it around him, digging into it to move around, creating massive explosions and pillars by slamming the ground. Should these pillars form underneath a hunter, it will trap them and suspend them several feet in the air. He feels like a proper god of the desert, expertly weaponizing the entire arena, and I'd love to see how these powers could be pushed even further in Modern Monster Hunter. His design is a lot like him. Very cool, and kind of goofy. He's got good colors, I like how the vibrant red stands out in the desert. His shell looks enormously cumbersome, and almost too big even for him, spilling past the sides of his own body. I'm not sure whether I love or hate the Thanos chin. I think he works really well when you see him moving. I'll give this guy an 8 out of 10 on how much I want to see him. I like him a lot, and I like the idea of a Cantor and Yukonlos getting a third member to their group. Variations. Now that we're done with all of the brand new original monsters, we're going to go through the powered up forms and named subspecies, rare species, variants, all of those other categories. First and foremost, we are going to breeze through the hardcore and supremacy species of Monster Hunter Frontier. I'm going to touch on these guys rather quickly, because quite frankly, I highly doubt we will ever see the hardcore monsters again. Supremacy species might have a slight chance, though I would say that some evolution of their concept might be possible. The reason for me bypassing them a little bit here and not thinking that they'll be coming back is, as visual designs and as fight designs, hardcore monsters feel the least divorced from their core monster of origin. 
They're stronger, older, and can do what the normal monster can do to a heightened degree, and a lot of other monster variations operate like this as well. But those other categories also carry the revamped designs, new titles, more intricate lore to further distinguish them. Looking at the hardcore monsters, their physical changes rarely go beyond a slightly exaggerated set of horns or claws. A few of them, like Abiorugu or Rajang, get some new noticeable changes, but some of the monsters are so similar that in gathering monster render images, I'll see these hardcore renders and just think it's a second render of the exact same monster. I think these hardcore monsters are valuable in the sense that they have cool moves that could find their way into the moveset of the respective base monster, and I could see an evolution of the hardcore gimmick. The problem is that they themselves don't carry enough of their own individual distinction in most cases to warrant covering separately. I feel somewhat similarly, but to a lesser degree, about the supremacy species monsters. There's much fewer of them, and they are much more exaggerated versions of their core monsters. Their designs are more distinct, they have more new mechanics and attacks. The supremacy Pariapuria is easily my favorite of the small club. He looks enormously different from the core Pariapuria and gives off a much different vibe. This is a group that, once again, might have some of their attacks and mechanics salvaged, but I doubt we will see them again. To further this point, they were kind of forgotten in their own game. Aruganosu and Goroganosu were retconned out of being Lavasioth's supremacy species, leaving only four left. One for Doragiorosu, one for Pariaporia, one for Teostra, and one for Oribatorosu. And none were added when Monster Hunter Frontier became Monster Hunter Frontier G. The supremacy species formula of taking a monster and turning it into an extremely over-the-top version of itself was also repeatedly outdone in the game's later life cycle. So that's my blurb about these two subcategories, worthwhile in their own game, possessing mechanics worth keeping, but I don't see them specifically coming back. Now onto the more self-distinct and named monster variations. Breeding Season Hypnocatrice. Quite self-explanatory, it's a male hypnocatrice looking to attract a mate. I really like this recolor, the darker body with brilliant blue and purple feathers. Probably my favorite version of Hypnocatrice in terms of design. Uh, and yes, there are others, we'll get to them later. He's an older subspecies, however, meaning he really doesn't have a lot about him mechanically that is different from the core Hypnocatrice. He's a bit more proficient at inducing sleep, and his hardcore version can release a stun gas, so that's something. I'll give him a 6 out of 10. Love the look, but he'd need a major rework. Lavasioth subspecies. Yeah, that's unfortunately the official name. Let's call it Red Lavasioth, another breeding season induced variation, like the aforementioned Hypnocatrice. This breeding season thing was a whole mechanic in Frontier, don't worry about it too much. Very similar song and dance. Stronger, tougher, faster. I do like the color, it's got a bit more fire and explosion shenanigans. 5 out of 10. Could maybe be cool with some tweaks. Espinas subspecies, already in the main series, rebranded as Flaming Espinas. He's a pretty good model for how you can improve some of these really old subspecies. He's an excellent fight, one of the best in Sunbreak. Silver Hypnocatrice. This is a rare species, which immediately gives it some bonus points, because rare species are a very exclusive club of extremely high quality monsters. He doesn't seem too crazy for what he is now, more prominent sleep, stronger kicks, ability to create tremors when he lands, though to be fair, the metal rasps weren't great until the 5th generation either. In fact, it wasn't really until the 3rd generation that the rare species became the famed grouping of monsters that it is today. Color palette looks solid, but not quite as good as the breeding season Hypnocatrice. I'll give him a 7 out of 10, because I know that him being a rare species, they'll treat him very well in terms of his moveset upgrades. Espinas rare species. A lot of what I just said maintains. Rare species are synonymous with fantastic variations nowadays. This white Espinas probably would need a few modern tweaks, but could be stellar, and really already is. He comes with some awesome abilities to coat massive areas in lingering poisonous fire. He can also create venomous puddles, toxic tornadoes, and massive flame twisters. Truth be told, there's a lot to work with already. I think he needs a few color tweaks, a little bit of correction to make his white and violet coloration look exceptional. Something about it doesn't look quite right in the base model. 9 out of 10 for wanting him. Keep the Espinas coming, please. Violent Laviente. And finally, we have a Laviente driven by his starvation. His fight is very similar to basic Laviente, with a few new moves. He's a bit more aggressive and attacks a little bit more. His colors, unfortunately, I think are quite a bit worse. Very washed out, losing a lot of the bright, distinct oranges and greens. 
Also, besides not looking as good, his other problem is that there's a much cooler variation of Laviente that I would rather have, and we'll talk about him in the next video. 4 out of 10 for wanting him, you'll see why soon. And that's all of them. That's every original monster and monster variation created during the original five years of Monster Hunter Frontier. Kinda sucks that I ended on a low note, but towards the end of this run, Frontier was focused on its hardcore and supremacy monsters, which, as I mentioned earlier, I did not find worthy of mentioning individually. They simply do more of what their core monster does. When we look at Monster Hunter Frontier G and Z in the next video, you'll see why the HC and Supremacy monsters were dropped. The development team would get much more creative with their monster variations. So that was... a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. And there's a long way to go, and a lot of good stuff to get to. And despite how enormous this project is, I'm more than happy to do it because it's worth doing. If these creatures are doomed to never return, they deserve to be remembered, and thankfully, I'm not the only one making an effort to preserve them. In addition, let us hope that Espinas stands as a flag bearer for the salvation of the majority of these fantastic creations in the years to come. I'd like to give a massive thank you to creators like Bandlegai Chris on Twitter, who has documented tons upon tons of Monster Hunter lore, including very digestible and concise lore on everything I just talked about. The community is going to be a bit sadder when he retires from doing Monster Hunter lore. The guys over at Rage Gaming Videos, who they themselves didn't initially love the Frontier universe until they managed to gain permission to try some salvage servers in a closed beta. They did a lengthy and fantastic series of videos, essentially doing a full playthrough of Frontier, and experiencing a lot of the game's wacky creatures and mechanics firsthand. The appreciation that they gradually developed for Frontier as they played it, after originally being distant naysayers, was a massive inspiration for me to make this series. As I came to adore the Frontier world alongside them, they deserve massive props for this as well. Thank you to anyone and everyone who contributed to the Monster wikis, and who posted gameplay of these fights online so that I could get a better grip of what these things could do. And a special thank you to the YouTubers who allowed me to use their footage for this video. A lot of these guys still actively post content, and I would recommend you visiting their channels. They all make good stuff. There's probably going to be an absolute ton of links to put in the description to credit all of these individuals, but I'll make sure their names are all present in the video too. Full credit goes to all of them for the footage in this video. And of course, thank you. I don't think I'll ever stop saying it, because it is becoming more and more deserved by the day. I did not think the channel would be doing this well right now. And so many of you, even those of you who have disagreed with me in my takes, have been enormously polite and extremely kind. And if you made it to this point, you just listened to a very amateur YouTuber talk for like, oh god, I have no idea, this script is on its 35th page right now. <laughs> Every day this comes closer and closer to being an actual job for me. And I will only get better from here. And unfortunately, and fortunately, my scripts will probably only get longer and longer. Because I do like to write about what I'm passionate about. So don't expect part two of this series for a little while. This was a pretty massive undertaking, and I don't want to only post four videos over the course of three months. I will be doing another Monster Hunter highlight video 
another are there any good or bad scenes in a Star Wars movie video, a Monster Hunter video unrelated to any of my other active series, a breakdown of The Mandalorian Season 3, and hopefully the Clone Wars rewatch and review should resume sometime soon as Cody's schedule opens back up. So that's what there is to look forward to on the channel coming up. Thank you again so, so much if you made it this far. Or even if you didn't and you can't hear me right now, I'm still thankful for the clicks. Please hit the like button if you enjoyed, subscribe and hit the notification bell if you want to see more. Which monsters from this video caught your eye the most? Or if you are already well versed in this area of Monster Hunter, tell me what non-mainline monsters you'd like to see the most. This has been CR Volcanic or Connor. I'm going to relax my voice right now and my typing fingers as I continue to edit this Leviathan of a video. And... If you've been an absolute chat and stuck around to the very end of this probably coming up on hour and a half long video, here's a tease for what the next Monster Hunter highlight video is going to be. Enjoy.